If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. Well, when I ended our previous recording with Ziggy, I said Ziggy will be back for ch chapter two, maybe even chapter three. There's lots that I still want to know. So yes, here is Ziggy. He's joined us again today, and I say thank you very much for doing that. Um, I think in the previous one, uh, well, I know in the previous one, Ziggy reckoned he was finished with 3-1, but I think he went away and had a bit of a rethink, and uh, he's going to give us some more of his days at 3-1 Battalion. Um, great days, uh, great stories I'm hearing, great tales of, of endeavor and of bravery and all sorts of different um, adventures that the lads had, and a lot of the guys went to the military for adventure. So with, with me saying very little more, uh, I'm going to say welcome, Ziggy. Uh, it's great to have you here. And yes, sir, off you go. You tell us what you feel like telling us today. As you pointed out so succinctly in uh, episode one, uh, it's your legacy you're chatting about. So go for it, sir. Uh, I'm eager to hear what you've got to tell us today. Um, morning, Fossi. Morning, viewers. Um, all right. After the last uh, episode that I recorded with Fossi, I have watched Paul Lowe's um, um, video and what last night watched Marco. Now, Paul and Marco were both um, with my brother, Tara Enza, a uh, corporal there. His story also to be read in their book. Maybe one day Fossi and um, Chris can get my brother to talk. I doubt it, but um, that's his right. Um, his story is in the book, if guys want to. But I just say, why not? I'm going to expose my contacts, the seven that I had with uh, with um, uh, with 301 Battalion, like I said to Fossi. I have reference in books, even from Swapo. This is a Swapo book. I will read an excerpt from it, just basically based on um, on, on uh, facts that I will mention. Um, uh, yeah, Marco's, Marco and Paul, the positivity behind them is very, it stands out very strong. Uh, the odds was dealt, dealt out to us as 18, 19 year old kids. And, you know, we need to tell the kids of today, our kids, kid future generations of what we went through. It wasn't nice. I mean, um, people were wounded, people were uh, mentally wounded. Um, the support we got afterwards, um, we talk a lot about the army. It's one way of getting, my family can't stop me. I mean, they switch off when I start talking army, my family leave the room. They've heard too much of it. So they're suffering from a, a post-traumatic stress disorder based on that is info. <laughs> but at the end of the day, my kids will watch this too. So yeah, let them see what we went through, why we are who we are, not all the bad parts, the positive parts. And that came very strong in Marco's um, uh, video. And I enjoy that. You know, I'm also a very positive person. Uh, just to this intro, while I had my first interview with the, with the three guys with a course, um, I had just come out of surgery cancer. This for Bay, you know, it was a scary moment for me, a month of, of waking up. And I decided, that's why I also decided to give my things. We're writing a book. I might not be here tomorrow. I'm not being negative, but there goes my legacy, never to be told. So I'm going to tell. And I also challenge uh, my friends out there to, to go out and to talk about it, you know, to keep this hidden. Yeah, like I say, yeah, I've got a book. I think there are two books that I know of. Maybe there's more of, of, of Swapu. We've got hundreds of books. And, you know, it, this near brag story, war isn't a brag um, situation. And there are no heroes. It's like Marco said, the, the, the guys who, who died in the war, they are the heroes. We're just happy to survive. Like Marco also said, we had someone watching us, and yes, he does watch us. And you will hear in my story too. I, I, um, 
You know, it's, it, you get emotional when you talk about these things because it's a reality. But okay, let me start off um, first with photos. I have many photos. I've never owned a camera in the army. Um, these photos I got from uh, friends and stuff. I was even accused of, of having one or two spools developed for someone. Um, but funny enough, the same photos that people refer to, uh, people after my time have too. So yeah, um, cameras were full up. And I want to mention that our book will not have photos of, of bodies, of kills, as we call it. That, remember, our terminology might sound harsh, but it was a harsh time. So when we refer to kills, uh, the, the sensitive viewer will, will show. But General Les Rudman, at our first meeting in 2009 with the Veterans Association, asked us all, please, ask me actually directly, if you publish a book, no photos of bodies. We have nothing to prove. And I agree with, the, with, the, with, the, with General uh, Rudman, Les, as we know him, um, in respect. We respect our enemy. And I'm damn sure, well, I've just spoken to someone just before this meeting that will arrange him, one of the three one guys from our wing that will arrange a meeting with me um, with one of these Swapu um, fighters. And I mean, this is interesting. The more we start talking to each other, a lot of people will say, ah, yes, yes, no, a booty, whatever, you know, and this and that, yes, a faraya, and so on. So, boys, that war is past. Don't create another war based on ignorance. All right, let me move on to my first contact. Um, drum roll. It sounds like a, <laughs> it sounds like a, a Oh, like a movie, as Marco said, the people in a movie. All right, we were flown from the Kwandu base. The Kwandu base was in the um, uh, eastern part of the Caprivi over the, the, the Kwandu River, um, on the, very close to the um, Cup Lane, the border of uh, Namibia, um, Caprivi, and Zambia. And that was our operating base. By this stage, it was already, uh, well, July, July, these things all happen in the question of, of July and August, September. I don't remember dates. The guys that were with me might be able to, in the book, might be able to add dates to this thing. Um, I didn't have a diary and wrote, write things down. Everything is here. It was bent into my head. So, yeah, we were flown in. Um, I don't know exactly what the area was. I, one of our officers from a other company, Ben Wolf, we did an interview with him. And I hope Ben comes on this program. Ben speaks Bushman, Vaskela, and Baraquena. I will speak to Ben and uh, see if he, I, I think oh, he has got Zoom because we actually did a meeting with him. But an interesting character and one of the guys that was the longest in the unit. But after speaking to Ben, um, he concurs with me on the fact that we were close to the Matabele Plains, which is deep. You know, you don't uh, you don't fly the chopper. You you sit in the chopper. You have got your headphones on, connected to the um, to the pilot, so you know what's going on, what he's telling you, and you've got the door open and you can view lovely view from from the air. Yeah, it's funny enough with my fear of heights, the chopper. I enjoyed chopper rides. Uh, we had quite a bit. All right, the, we landed. We landed in the area we were designated for and took over by our recce wing, Harvey Nell, um, and his guys were in the specific area. Our target was to move further north, and if my memories confirm with me, basically Swazi Nodia, my platoon commander had taken over the company because Hor Hor, um, Franz Hunter, had left the unit only to return later. Because we hadn't had this, like I say, this was our first contact. We landed and Harvey and Swazi basically had their little uh, quick order group in the bush. Um, Harvey had kind of exposed, but I mean, I know he shared some of his water with, uh, with Swazi and I don't think he fooled me because um, who shares water in the bush? That bottle had a bit of rum in. 
why not? If not, why not? And Harvey was was well known for his red hot rum in those days. But a little bit of comfort in the bush is also good. All right. H Harvey said to Swazi, don't move in a northerly, northerly direction, move in a northeasterly direction. Um, so basically change our, our, our modus operandi. And yeah, when just after the choppers, the, the choppers left extracting the um, recce wing, um, I assume that Swapu, uh, or the plan, uh, assumed that the reckeys had left the area because we were just settling in, getting kit sorted and stuff when we heard a few rifle shots go off and immediately went into action, lay a quick ambush. And yeah, we hit the contact. Um, we got two of the guys. Um, they were actually hunting. They weren't shooting at any target. They were out to, to get food. And we got the two and they gave chase. They ran off and uh, Marcel Fires and um, Bath, uh, Rodney McRae Bath, Corporal Bath, our company sergeant major, as a copy of Corporal, set chase after the, the, um, the enemy with a few Bushmen. That's where we got our name Fire Force. Um, we took it on to ourselves to run after these guys. Remember, Eckers no duck. Those days, I was only 19 years old, uh, super fit. Actually, I was 20, uh, not 21. I was 20 already because it, it was July. My birthday is in June. So I was, I spent my uh, 20th birthday in the bush. Uh, but in any case, we set chase after these guys. And um, along the way, it's the first time I've seen a syringe. Um, they obviously were injecting themselves with whatever. Got to a rude awakening that the SADF's uh, um, webbing was not meant for heavy loads and for running because my body was full of uh, shave marks. But to cut that short, we returned the chopper, uh, the um, a little wet chopper came in to collect the two bodies. I can remember, um, you know, I must mention that now already a Bushman is not fond of working with the dead, with a, with a, with a corpse, irrelevant, own or whatever. So we corporals had the dirty work of loading any kills and stuff. Again, I refer to the word, it's uh, bodies. So, but in any case, uh, loaded the two bodies into the uh, chopper. Um, uh, I, I won't reveal everything because there's some things that are just too gory for me to even, um, it doesn't boost, uh, the, the war is ugly. Money alcohol. We load the two bodies in and they took off. I still know that one of the Impalas came in and gave a victory roll. The first time I've seen amazing a feeling to see uh, um, an Impala come over. Remember, we didn't have the Mirages. We had the Impalas. We call them the blue jobs. Their bellies were painted blue, so obviously to camouflage them from the sky. So we refer to them as blue jobs. Um, the guy gave a victory roll over us. It was amazing. It's, while you're there in the bush, it spurs you on, um, gives you that esprit de corps situation. But in any case, from there, we moved out of the area after the, bo the bodies had been removed by the chopper. Um, obviously, they had support in the air too. That's why the MIGs were there too, to, to um, not MIGs, Impala, uh, to, to, to uh, give support. But in any case, that evening we moved into a temporary base. Uh, I must mention we were a, about a company strength. Uh, we moved into a temporary base and about two o'clock at night, we heard this terrible howl, um, cry out. And obviously, you jump into action, get behind your weapon, everything. And <laughs> the gist of it all, Nella, one of our PF corporals, um, also his first contact, also a youngster. Um, later on, uh, well, he was permanent force, also one of the recce's later on. But Nella had a nightmare. <laughs> and he shouted out. So we got that rude awakening in the middle of the night. A bit of a joke. Nella, sorry. Uh, um, if I mention this, but I mean, 
it's a reality. Also, there was, I don't think it was fear because you were the only guy that, that, that I know would laugh through a contact. So it wasn't a question of fear. It was just your mind playing games with you. But in any case, we split up. I was dealt in uh, with Nikki Kutsia because my platoon, uh, having Swazi as the company commander, uh, our platoon stayed behind in, in the, as base protection in Kwandu. So myself and Fires were dealt in, and we were like the uh, spare wheel, the spare tire. We were dealt into wherever they felt putting us, and we didn't want to stay in base. I mean, those were the young days when you, you, you volunteered for everything, for anything. All right, those two guys, all right, were, were the few, were, were the first two. The next morning we moved out and I moved with, with Nikki into a, um, like a reconnaissance sort of uh, patrol. And we found vehicle tracks of Land Rover or whatever, but you could see they were dropping food off because all the, there was some rice and beans and stuff that had been spilt. And they, obviously, that's where pollution came in. The tins, that, the bigger tins, um, there was a whole chicken, baby kip. It was a Dutch product. Smoker would love to still try one. I mean, in the bush, you see a tin like that with the label on. And, you know, there was a whole chicken in that tin before you got there. You're always hungry in the bush. But they had eaten the main heavy supplies first, which any soldier will do, lessen your weight and keep the rice and stuff to, to, um, to carry a lighter load. But on moving out further, we approached an area with a lot of footprints. Um, it, it looked like we were approaching a base. And again, myself, uh, fires, myself, Bath, took the, the uh, mags and spread out in a single line with the three of us in front, with the Bushmen spread out. And we approached um, uh, with Nikki and then just behind us with the main force. But we, we approached this nice big tree, um, hoping to catch these guys in surprise. As we got closer, you found more tins and more uh, pollution, wars pollution. But approaching this, walking with your, with your mag ready, in the position to, to draw fire and lay down heavy fire. I did mention in previous um, uh, interview, basically, that we, we all carried at least three 103 rifle grenades, okay, not on the mag, but on the R1s. Bushman carried R1s. And whenever we hit, if we hit a contact, we basically had a, we laid down heavy fire before, the battle start to get your bearing and to 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 scare the enemy obviously because um that's the point of war not only kill us to to, to scare the guys i mean yeah that's a bomb but in any case nothing in the nothing came out of this um little approach to this tree they had left already but we knew there was big activity in the area so we were in the right spot harvey had, had directed us into the right direction. Obviously, that is what the Iraqis are there for, reconnaissance so that we can, can um, do the work. But we approached a water, a water hole. Um, uh, and obviously, they trucks like mad. So Nikki decided that guys like Lieutenant um, Heinlein, Heinlein and I think Oppis, uh, one of the corporals, uh, Oppis Opperman, um, also wore tackies, North Star tackies. We were allowed to wear what we wanted in the bush. You didn't, it wasn't for parade purposes and stuff. I mean, we even had our sleeves off Rambo style. Um, no one ever saw us, so what's the, what's the point of being Rambo? Um, it was a question of heat, and the Rekis would wear their sleeves long again. Less, leg is less black is beautiful. We didn't think of it that way. We thought of the heat, the, um, the heat and the flies, the tsetse flies. But at the end of the day, this waterhole was very active um, in tracks. So Nikki sent Heinlein and uh, Opis down to the waterhole and filled water bottles as much as possible, but not leaving any tracks. And we joined up with Swazi 
uh, with the main force and obviously planning went about there. And we decided to lay, or Swazi decided to lay a ambush at the waterhole with Nikki in charge. So it was Nikki, um, uh, Heinlein, uh, Lieutenant Heinlein, uh, and then Fires, Corey Janssen van Vieren, later on for Ricky. Uh, Nikki also was a teacher, but he, he never went to teach. He joined PF after he stint with uh, with with three one battalion. And Nikki is also will come up again when Johannes Congo was was killed in uh, ambush. Uh, but in any case, we lay a ambush. Oh, yeah, and then another white corporal was uh, George Tawil of the Tawil boxing family. Uh, George uh, um, basically sat on the back of the ambush. Well, we moved in at night into a Shona of Oramba, not Omaramba, don't, don't, my brain still plays games with me with the Shona and the Omaramba. I think we had Shonas and the Wamboland at Omarambas. The one runs in one direction, the one, I'm not here to, 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 to argue about a simple point, like make a mistake and then end up in an argument about it later on. But at the end of the day, we moved in, left George at a, this was at last light, left George at a tree, basically covering us with, with two bushmen and a 60 mil uh, patrol mortar so that he could lay down mortar fire if we should um, uh, hit a contact. Um, we leopard crawled, I've never leopard crawled in, in, in any situation, but this one we did. We leopard crawled into position um, in an arc around the, the water hole opposing the main bush, so in the open area, um, with Heinlein on the, on the left flank. I'm not sure exactly which flank, but Heinlein and um, Fires, Corey, my assistant corporal, on the two edges with a crossfire with the two LNGs. Um, and with two bushmen each, and myself and Nikki in the middle of the ambush with two bushmen each, but nicely spread out, little groups of three. And that's how the ambush started. We lay, spent the night, um, obviously uh, trusting the bushmen. You did take a snooze, um, of what I did. I've mentioned that before, I take an easy route. But I had a good sleep, and the next morning, first light, the bush started coming alive. It's amazing to lie over there and, and not being able to speak, move, you lay as still as possible. And you hear the bush coming alive as water. Animals come to the bush, after the water hole, birds. It, it's just amazing how night becomes day and life is there around it. And obviously this rude awakening next morning, sunlight. Woo. Myself and Nikki are in direct sunlight with um, Heinlein and uh, fires under the nice tree, nice two trees. But at the end of the day, I started getting bored, which I do. Um, yeah, about 10 o'clock, I turned around on my back and took out a book and started reading the book. Now this book is quite, uh, will, will come up later on again. It was called The Drifters. It's an American book of the Vietnam War where guys basically tried to, to um, desert their draft situation. I never read the book finished. We were, <laughs> I was I got a rude awakening in the ambush. But lying there, we had a system that the Bushmen would warn us, basically, if there was something, we didn't have little, I don't think we had tokies. Maybe we did, I don't know. But in any case, we were, the, the planning was that should they approach the waterhole, Nikki, being a very good shot, um, at the Busian, uh, Plasbur, um, but Nikki would open with the first shot, which would give us the cue to open fire too. Huh. No one warned me. I carried on reading, and the next thing, a shot rang out. At police, what they amboche do it. In any case, the book went flying. It turned around, and hey. Lo and behold, there were two guys at the water hole. And we lay down fire like mad. And both went down. I think Nikki shot took the guy out, um, the, the one of the guys out, because um, he hit his buckle. 
we had hit the guy in the stomach and obviously that caused the bullet to, to, to do a dummy type of effect. But the, the firefight carried on for I can't know how long. We drew fire from out of the bush too. Um, and like I said, the 103s were fired off also, set the, the grass alight, and we had a fire on the opposite side. Luckily, plan were firing a high. They were known for that. I'm sorry to say not being ugly, but they, uh, in most contacts that I was involved in, the firing was luckily too high. But um, we moved around when the fire, when the firefight subsided, we moved around the water hole to the, the area where the, where the two bodies were lying. Swazi had already joined, joined, up with a, joined up with us with an extra force. Um, and yeah, there the, were these two chappies. Um, and obviously half burnt two from the fire of uh, um, the bush that was around them. And as young people, we always reached out for memorabilia, a little bayonet. The Bacchalite bayonet was a, was a, a trophy. That, that everyone's after. And, I, and then myself and two Bushmen moved into the bush further just to go and investigate. Um, and it gets scary, you just three guys. And I approached a tree, one of the bushes. There was a hat hanging on it. Now, it act like a bung because you don't know if it's booby trapped or not. Uh, but I approached cautiously, took the um, R1 and lifted this thing out of the tree. It was one of these bunnies that the Russians had, a gray sort of one that falls over. I've given it to one of the my collector friends in Warfish by a young chap that collects a lot of member, oh, not member, trophies of war, um, knowing that my kids aren't interested in it. Um, but uh, Vincent... Um, Fernandez, a Portuguese friend of mine, one of my old karate students too, is a very staunch collector, one of the most beautiful collections. I hope Vincent one day will share a picture what he shares every now and then. Um, but in any case, that is one of the things that uh, Vincent now has in a collection uh, referring to this contact. But we moved out and reorganized and started moving. Obviously, you get away from any fire fight scene as quick as possible because you're going to, to um, you know what, I don't even know, can't even remember how these bodies were collected because the bodies were always collected for identification and then also what they call an eight style parada, call the locals in and basically show them uh, war of mind, uh, mind games. Um, it was done, but I can't remember how these two bodies were were, were evacuated. Um, but in any case, we moved out in single fine line, lines and um, started walking. Now we had one uh, one old bushman called Kafuru, Kafuru Kabangu, and he previously had lost an eye and a piece of his arm in a booby trap in a Vambulan in earlier years. Now, Kafuru was a character on his own. You always making jokes, always, you know, you, he will come up in our book a lot and maybe interviews a lot of the guys, but Kafuru started setting the bush alight as we walked. And we said to Kafuru, what, Mike, you know, what are you doing? You spoke Afrikaans to the Bushmen, those who could speak uh, Afrikaans, the rest were Portuguese. But I said, what, Mike? I said, you know, a swap was a land, you know? And he was setting the bush alight uh, out of uh, whatever. Okay, we stopped him, but the damage had already been done. That evening, we moved into a TB um, a couple of kilometers away from the actual um, initial contact scene and um, formed our little circle. And in the night, the wind changed and this fire started approaching us. And I'm telling you, uh, with the bu recent bushfires in Namibia and videos you've seen, a, bu a bushfire is a terrible thing. Grass is, and now you, it's night, you're already spread out quite wide and you must do something. 
this fire was pushing us directly. And Corporal Barth, um, uh, Roderick McCray Barth, said to me, Ziggy, we stick together. And I said to him, why? And he said to me, Ziggy, because you got the radio. Clever. I mean, you, with communications in the bush is very important. And we decided with a couple of bushmen to walk through the fire, to approach, because obviously behind the fire, the damage has already been done. Find a weak spot and move through, which we did. Myself, Fires and uh, Bath and a couple of bushmen. When we turned around, we actually saw that the bushmen had already made a fire break. This is why I say these guys uh, thought ahead. They, they, they lived in the bush. They grew up in the bush. So they had made a fire break. And this fire was moving around our temporary base. So you've got this little call, this little circle, quite a big circle because it's a whole company. We were about 90 people. Um, so, and we went in and laid, uh, spent the night. The next morning, on wanting to move out, um, the Bushman had reported that two o'clock, four o'clock, and six o'clock in the night, they heard vehicles. I didn't hear it. It was not a dove died at me, but the Bushmen were good at sound and bush and nightlife, whatever. But they had reported. And Swazi reported to Katima Molino, to uh, Major Ulsich. Um, Major Ulsich had said, I think he was a major later on, I don't know how far he went, but um, his wife was a teacher in Walfish Bay too, actually taught my, taught my wife, a small world we live in. But Major Ulsich had said to him, based on what information would you, are you requesting air support? And he said, from the Bushman. And Major Ulsich said, no, there's no choppers available, this and that and so and so. And already we were running low on, 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 uh, on food. And there's nothing more negative than a, a, um, a fighting force, a hungry fighting force. So we made a grave mistake. We stayed in that base. Was, you know, we were unbeatable. And communicating with, uh, um, with uh, Kat Katima, um, and here around two o'clock that afternoon, um, we had gathered together in a group of, of NCOs that weren't necessary to be with the troops and of the officers, obviously, two, one side, one radio, two, two TR-48s. One radio was on, was it, I don't even know what the radio station, could have been Radio 5 or something like that, uh, come alive with Radio 5, catch the... the, the, the <laughs> the pun in the whole situation. But in any case, a shot rang out again. And immediately things will, um, um, you know, the guys that lull, it's a few seconds that feels like hours. Your shot goes off, your brain kicks into action. I think Marco also, Marco Kofori also mentioned, the shot rings out and it takes a while for your brain to set in. Did one of your, your, your troops accidentally pull off a shot or is it the enemy and before you really could calculate anything all hell broke loose they hit us they had formed a v uh, ambush around us with stopper groups behind us they had enough time to prepare i mean the last vehicle that the bushman heard was uh, um, at uh, six o'clock that morning, two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock, basically two hours. To, so they were out to wipe us out. And branches started flying. I mean, Oppies was reading that same book that I read in the ambush, The, the Drifters. And myself and Bath actually didn't leopard crawl away. We ran over Oppies <laughs> in the whole thing. Um, now you, First thing is find your kit. You had put your kit down, and this this fire is coming in from this V situation. This this world, it's 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 a noise. It's a, but you are observing what's going around on around you, and finding my kit. I know Garth Van Nikak, Lieutenant Garth Van Nikak, was about to grab his R1 when an RPG hit uh, his kit, his, his R1 and his kit. Um, I will post a picture of his camera of Garth. took most of the pictures in, in, in the Ayasika, I think the camera was. But it, 
to see what the camera looks like. He still has it today, um, full of scrap mill. I mean, himself got a bit in his face and his body too. But uh, Nella, Corporal Nell had grabbed the Patmore um, mortar now, why I mentioned him earlier, was he started throwing 60 mil mortars in through the trees. And while looking up, he started laughing. I mean, and he was saying, look how these things are tumbling in the air or hitting branches. So even while things were going on, there was time to even view this, uh, um, this funny little factor that he found. Um, all right. Myself and Bath were done by our kit, and Bath said to me, Ziggy, let's go. I basically say, the, this is the first time I actually prayed. I prayed in a contact, not the first time I prayed, but in a contact. I actually prayed because all hell was being broken loose. One of the Bushmen approached us um, walking to, to, they had a lot of respect for Bath. They called him Corporal English. Um, I think. And if I speak on a correction, the air path originated from Rhodesia, um, but it didn't speak a good Afrikaans. And therefore, the Bushmen, the Bushmen just respected English. I don't know why. They wanted to learn English. Um, but this Bushman approached us and came towards us, Corporal English, and he had a gash, a of a gash in his head, the blood. And as his heart was beeping, was pumping, and we just told him, Falcon, down, you know, get down. And he went and sat right in front of the two of us, looking at us while this blood was busy pumping. And then Bart said to me, Ziggy, let's go. I said, where? He said, forward, which is actually the duty of any force. And I know I grabbed my grootsak, the backpack, and then I held this in front of me. It wouldn't mean any, but just that, that mental thing of protection, running with your R1 and with this bag in front of me. The next thing, Bath was gone. And I thought, hell, he'd been shot. And then anger mixed with adrenaline set in, and I was determined to go for it. But in the meantime, Bath had passed um, uh, Nikki's uh, a little, we didn't dig um, little trenches because like the bushman said wherever you dig a hole like that in the bush the enemy for months after would see exactly what the size of your movement was so we we didn't do what we were taught in in Otsu. Uh, it was a different warfare we were fighting the, the war on foot so your numbers always counted because um, the enemy knowing that you were 20 or 80 or 90 would always um, treble. That's the laws of, of averages in war. You come with a force three times the size of your enemy to wipe them out. Um, but in any case, Bath had jumped into next to Nikki <laughs> in his rope craft, so I understood. But I moved forward to the outer circle, and one of the lance corporals um, had. Um, join me because we had advanced a like, get up and fight right? we to get up and move and to my shock is it was only only myself and, and and this lance corporal that had moved forward i mean i turned around and spoke in languages that no one would <laughs> means us all people will shrivel if they heard the, the, the words that came out of my mouth that day but in the meantime the Impala started approaching to, to give us a support fire. And everyone started shouting, smoke, 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 you know, white smoke. That is so that they can see where we are, that they don't bring down fire on us. And we leader group carried white phosphor. Only the leader group. I mean, people that know what white phosphor is. I don't even know if it was part of the Geneva Con uh, Convention, but we, the Bushmen saw my Grootsak that was held, being held in front of me lying on the ground there, and there was a, a white grenade on. He pulled this and threw it. Uh, I'm lucky to be here today based on that sort of situation, but it was white phosphor that he had thrown. 
because this little flame is a piece of phosphor and if you know phosphor, if it gets on you, you can put your arm under water and it'll stop burning, but take your, water, your hand out and it'll carry, carry on burning. So you basically have to cut it off to get it off you. But luckily, none of this hit any of us. But in any case, um, the Impalas moved in, started, they, in this book, they say they didn't, the Impalas didn't fire, they did. I think they hit one or two vehicles that the guys were brought in, but, um, okay, the, I did go to the beginning the, for the, of when this, when this first few shots fired off, um, Fires was lying sleeping. Now I took Fires, uh, Corey Janssen was lying sleeping, and he was one of one of our main. I'll post a picture of Fires walking with a mag in those days, the the LMG, and Fires woke up and grabbed his mag, put it in a tree, and started opening over our troops' heads from the center, on the enemy too. He opened up fire straight away, and nearby him was a, a signaler. And this guy actually, from shock, started stuttering. Couldn't get his message out on the radio. And Fires grabbed the radio and he said, Steve, I won't repeat the swear words, the effing uh, um, uh, imps, um, the blue jobs, let's get it cock out or something. And it was. The guys that were sitting in ops rooms out in the Caprivi basically says it was horrific to hear this firefight the mountain. I mean, like they say, branches falling on you, mortars coming in. Um, it, it was hell. But yeah, they did come in. Um, after this firefight, we regrouped. The free line came in. We had 12 wounded, of which one was um, uh, Lieutenant uh, Garth van Ekak, uh, Hans Kaki, as we called him. Um, but one of the Bushmen that I treated was hit by a piece of scrap metal on his hip and had ricocheted up to his chest and bounced off right next to his heart. Now, I had this guy in front of me and was busy putting a drip on. I couldn't find a vein. And like I said, the Bushmen get quite emotional when one of their own die. Um, very close-knit uh, family, um, or tribe. But I looked at Swazi and I said to Swazi, nah, this guy didn't want to say it out. This guy is not near with us anymore. And Swazi said, near Ziki, and he put his hand on the guy and could feel there was still warmth warm breath coming out of his nose. And so as he eventually applied a drip on the top of the guy's hand, um, the, I must mention that the Bushman loved wearing a jersey in the bush. Why, I don't know, but I think the Arabs do it to the more layers of clothes you've got, the, the longer the cool air stays in, I assume. I just could never see myself wearing a jersey. But this guy was quite a mess because wool and blood are not, are, are not friends. But at the end of the day, he was Kazavak, um, survived. I met him with my wife five years later, 1984, and he was fighting again. It just amazed me that, uh, if, I don't want to sound racial or something, but how we white soldiers basically were given a pension, a slap on the back, and you never did a camp afterwards. We had the Bushman carried on fighting. It's a it's a it's a, a sensitive point to, to to tackle. But this I, I can't remember his name. Fires will Fires is very good with names. Fires would be able to tell you every each person that I mention here's name. Akazma Dong. When I remember faces, but I don't remember names. But they had flown out, and yeah, we had to move out as quick as possible again. Uh, you don't say, well, we had spent too, too many hours in that TV, but we moved out. And then let me just go to, to my next situation. I've got they ambushed us. So, what all? All right. Uh, sorry, I've, this is many years ago. So, that was now number, uh, number three. Number four. Um, 
being dealt in with Nikki, I don't know if it was this ops or ops of Fran, no, ops of, I could have been, no, no, ops of Fran, um, Franz Hunter was with us. But I, I'm doing patrol with Nikki and I think Nell, Nella was his, um, had Nell, was his um, corporal. We also found an area where we assumed enemy activity and obviously you drop your main kit. I stayed behind with two bushmen with the kit and climbed up in a tree for communications uh, with, the, uh, with the bigger force. And while up in that tree, and Nikki and them drew fire from uh, a small group of Swapu. Um, one of the Bushmen still had a hole in his hat. That's how close the bullet was. But they fired high, and I was sitting up in the tree. So that was Kudus Vat I nearly fell out of that tree, but I got out there uh, hell of a fast. I called the contact, you know, you know, the whole situation for those who don't know war. As soon as uh, shots are fired, you immediately shout, contact, contact. Uh, in other words, that contact contact is a signal for all people that are on the radio to stop talking on the radio and give access for the for the for the uh, the, the unit or the section that's under fire to have an open uh, bandwidth. Basically, don't block the channel. These guys need help. But that's what I called. And okay, Nikki and him. It wasn't a serious, we, we, there was no kills in this situation, except just pride, uh, the guy nearly falling out of the tree. But we, that was number, number four. Um, number five was a situation where we moved um, towards a crawl in, in, in Zambia. And the Bushman picked up reflections and stuff in the, um, in the crawl and Trump had taken refuge behind cattle and, and the local population and started firing at us. We laid on fire, obviously, and there, were, there was collateral damage. Luckily, no one killed, but there were a couple of the local population that were wounded. Now, I, I, a very funny thing, when you work with Bushmen, that were the hunter tribe. They 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 are known to be fierce. They they not fierce. They defended themselves because they were be they were hunted. They were the hunted by other black tribes. But what they couldn't fathom is we had free loans come in to collect the wounded uh, local population to be sent to South Africa or Namibia or South Africa those days to be repaired. At our countries it costs, but. The com ops, the communication operation side always played a role too. Um, the army brought, sent in a lot of sugar and food and stuff for these guys, sort of a compromise, you know, sorry that your, that your family was caught in the crossfire. Like I say, it's a war. But at the end of the day, the Bushmen couldn't understand this. Why are we feeding these guys? Swapo was in their crowd. Now, you can imagine if, if they didn't have the leader element, what would have uh, happened in that situation? Enemy irrelevant was brutal. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the stories and stuff that one hears um, is, is, is a farce. We, we did look after even the local population. War has many stories, and I don't remember any brutality to to, um, to 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 local population. Not with Swazi in charge. In any case, uh, Swazi Swazi was a gentleman. Is a gentleman. Um, it wouldn't even let us hunt unnecessarily. If we hunt, if we hunted, it would be a, a, a daker key, and the whole platoon would share the daker. In other words, thirty guys on one daker. And funny enough, Swazi would always go and sit and eat with the Bushmen. He would eat the brains, the hearts and stuff. Uh, and myself and Fires would get a whole um, a hindquarter, you know, which is quite a bit of meat for two guys, but we were looked after, the leader group. But all right, number, number that was number four, five, number five. Number six, by number... My contact number six, Horkor, um, Franz Hunter had returned to the 
to uh, and resigned from Sibi Street and joined up permanent force in the army. And he was our company commander again. Um, Nikki had Nikki again plays a role here. Nikki had been on a scouting patrol out with a, a small group of guys. And we assume that Swapu found the, had found the area that they slept the night before and reckoned we were a small force where we were a company, but they had laid an ambush for us. We moved in the middle of the day, 12 o'clock is mid to midday. It was the hottest, obviously. We found a shot out um, Russian vehicle. I've got a photo of that. I'll also post that picture. We found this vehicle that had been priorly shot out by the Impalos or something. But we all obviously had a look at this thing, got pictures of the guys standing around the vehicle. And from there, we moved over Shona or Maramba or whatever and set up base, a, a temporary base for the afternoon, the, the, the warmest time of the day, um, set up a, um, a TV formed the circle. Myself and the other corporals were sitting on the approach area, otherwise, otherwise facing the Umaramba. And while we were chatting, Swazi approached and said I must join him. Um, uh, Jorge decided to send out two little scouting patrols, uh, one in an easterly direction and one in a northerly direction. Um, I was negative. Had a bit of an argument with Swazi. He knows about it. I was this was Nimoini. But in any case, Fires took my position and joined Swazi. Uh, I sat with the other boys who were smoking and let them blow their smoke over me for the Mapani flies that were in your nose and your ears. Um, sipping on water that we had got out of a water hole. Now remember, we shared water holes with elephants and all the animals. So the water was never clean or so what we did is we would take this little toffee sweet, there's a caramel, salted caramel sweet, and put this in the water and slur it around. You would have the sweet, filthy slush that you would drink, just to disguise it a bit. But we were sipping away when all of a sudden shots rang out. Now, Swazi had moved in a northern direction with, I don't know, 10 men, 10 men with fires. And... Um, and Nikki had moved out with Goth, Fanikak, and a few guys in the easterly direction. They walked slap bang into an ambush that were laying watching us. They didn't spring the ambush because they had seen we were a massive force. So they were watching us. Uh, why I say they didn't spring the ambush is I've got a picture of, um, of Heinlein, of Lieutenant Heinlein, with a, a, a RPD. Um, with cotton in the in in the barrel store. That's how the spoils of war. I've got a picture with him. Uh, I must add, in this this patrol, we had been issued buffles because you'll see a buffle in the background of um, of of. But the buffles always moved in the background and caught up later on. So, but Johannes Konger saw the ambush. And I wasn't in that group, but as the writing goes, Nikki is the right guy too. Nikki said, promise me he'll give me the full story. I will get it from him. His point of view. Remember, we all have incidents here. What I'm saying today is what I experienced in it, in this whole thing. My memory allows me to experience. But um, Johannes had ran in front of covering Lieutenant Heinlein when they opened fire and took the, the main brunt of the bullets on himself. He was wounded in the chest. And I can't talk much about that firefight there. All that I can basically say is I know I approached Johannes's body. And well, he wasn't dead yet. But I approached Johannes, and they, I, in my writing, you'll see Oppies will write. We all actually write the same, very similar stories. We're not stealing each other's stories. Boys, we were there together. And it's just little things that were in your mind or that you experienced that would change the thing. But the fact is, um, Johannes was lying there bleeding. And I thought it was a medic. 
but you know we didn't actually have medics but i think in my first story that it's, that's on the internet i mentioned a medic sitting there panicking uh, obviously i won't say you were panicking you were basically shell shock where so was i i mean here's this guy lying and basically bleeding to death um i grabbed a drip and uh with the Akapi knife, the famous Akapi cheap knife that we carried to open tins with that, um, slashed through the uh, bag, let the liquid out and covered his wound. Uh, this bugged me because we had basic uh, body aid medical training. We weren't medics. And um, when I think back, the right thing would have been, you know, you hear Paul also, Paul, I mean, or you always think back is what could I have done differently? Now, I always think back, and, you know, and I, I, uh, speaking to doctors, being uh, you know, all the years, older person now, you turn the guy onto his bad lung because he actually drowns in blood when you've got a chest wound. Now, me covering the holes wasn't a good thing either. But never mind. Um, Johannes must have died while I was standing there because he turned a funny color and everything. And then all of a sudden, shots rang out and immediately you react. But this was now Swazi. The, the force that Nikki had hit had taken escape north and they ran slap bang into fires in Swazi. And they uh, Swazi and fires and these and the troops rained that rained down like mad on them, um, taking ten. So it was a one to ten ratio. Johannes Congo was taken that day. Got his Norris crook. Apparently the first uh, non-white soldier to get a Norris crook. Um, I I cannot. This is what I believe. If anyone can correct me. Uh, it's an innocent mistake, but this is what I'm led to believe that Johannes was the first non non white um, soldier to 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 get a Norris Crooks, and deservedly so. Johannes was a was a nice guy. He was a funny character. You know, the, the, we dedicate the song Hotel California to Johannes Congo. Now, people, you can even go and look at the army. The army's version of this contact was in a bumble land and it was, um, they were hiding behind cows and all. I mean, that's, that version of, the, of um, the army is a lot of bull. The, this all happened in Zambia and it wasn't like the video. But they also called the video Hotel California. And why we, why we dedicate it Johannes was one of the Bushmen that who wanted to. Let me speak about Johannes a bit. I mean, yeah, in respect to the to the young man, he was a, a character and a half. You know, always mixing with the with the officers and the NCOs, joking and um, wanting to learn English. We had told Johannes that Hotel California means good morning. So Johannes would approach an officer and salute him and say, Hotel, Hotel California, later Lanti. You know, later Nanti, they always had their way of speaking. And uh, it's, it's nice stories, actually, in, in, in one side. But we also, um, the NCOs especially, would teach Johannes swear words in English. And he caught on to that. And he'd always say, Koparal Prati Moini, you know. But you're bored in the bush and you, you find any way of, of having a bit of entertainment. Um, I will also look for pictures of Johannes and Nikki that I, um, I have. Um, they will all be in the book. I mean, uh, Dani must excuse me if I use pictures now already, but at the end of the day, they, there's over 5,000 photos that Dani's got, if not more. So the book could be a coffee a photo book even if so, but where there will be stories. But in any case, we, I rushed off to join fires then, but the firefight had already finished there. Um, the, but we started collecting the bodies and stuff, which I, or the NCOs had to do. And I remember clearly one of the, the, the enemy had been shot in the back. I think uh, 103 hit him, which had caught quite a mess. His back was basically hollowed out, but he was lying with his hand on top of an RPG that had a hole through. Uh, that was assumed unstable. So I grabbed him by the feet and started pulling and 
his body started ripping. So we couldn't get him off the, that, that way. So young and stupid, I lay down my face away, grabbed him on the arm and pulled him off slowly off the, 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 the RPG to, to take the body to the collection area. Obviously, some of our guys were wounded too in the process. I remember myself and Fires taking one of the Bushmen that had been hit on the arm. Now, it, it, it must have been RPG or something because it wasn't a bullet wound. His flesh had been ripped off, completely off his arm. And the, the sinew, what I can remember as a young man, this, the sinews were still, the leak, whatever you want to call them, was basically intact. And I had this arm over my side, myself full of blood. You, you don't, it doesn't bother you. But we took him back to the main, the center of the base. Now, why I mention this story is Fires lost a finger on an on a operation that I wasn't with, a clandestine where we wore camo kit and stuff. You, you took your kit off on the cup lane and the border and put on camouflage um, um, equipment. But just prior to, to, to entering Angola, that was still in the Angolan side, this is prior to this, um, this is still in the easy days when we didn't hit any contact, but did a lot of patrols too. Um, but in any case, fires had the Unimog has got a protection base on the on the front, like a little metal piece that had hit a log and dislodged and, and, and influenced the steering. Now fires could tell the whole story properly, but fires had climbed on and a fires is a tough guy still today. Diver for Ricky uh, uh farmer nowadays. But Fires climbed in, lodged his boots against the log, grabbed with his two hands and forced this thing. And the thing came loose and sliced Fires finger off. I was in base due because I had an abscess on my eye and I couldn't go. The doctors didn't want me to because it's too, too dangerous. So I was standing, getting ready for PT. Couldn't go to the bush, but I could still do PT. Ducks, uh, Sergeant Major didn't have any sympathy with the doctors, but uh, Sergeant Major Ridgeway came, uh, one of the Eng English Sergeant Majors um, came calling out for Sergeant Enzo, uh, Corporal Enzo, sorry, and um, said that fires had an, an accident in the bush and was looking for me. Um, when I got to the six bay, Fires arrived a bit later at the back of the Unimog and in pain. There's no whole here. The sensitive part of the body sliced off, not with a sharp knife, with a blunt piece of metal. Um, he just said to me, Ziggy, I had my finger in my pocket and it's not there. Please look for it so they can try and recover it. Oh, well, fires already heard it. I think he's heard it already. But we did find his finger. Myself and I don't know who was with me, but we, we found the finger. And this thing, I mean, built on a la carte. This thing was, so we threw it away. Um, and to get back to that contract, the troop that we had basically helped with the arm had been ripped off, one of his fingers was also... I think it was his ring finger, was also um, uh, partly severed. The bone was gone. It was just a little piece of string. And Fires took out his akapi. <laughs> and this is the jest in war. Took that finger, cut it off, and he said, no can ek ook a finger weg. And now I can also throw a finger away and threw the Bushman's finger away. <laughs> Retribute revenge to his little situation. But these are little things that happen while you're on the ground. In, in the, the choppers came in to load the bodies. The Super Freelon came in. The Super Freelon, I think, they stopped operating in the early 80s. A very vulnerable, bulky helicopter, but uh, good for, for loads and stuff. Um, the bodies, we had to carry the bodies and load them into the chopper, the corporals. And Johannes was laid nicely on his stretchers. These guys were piled in, in the chopper. They left just before last night, and we had to get away. Like I said, you move away. We loaded the Biffles, 
can't remember how many buffles we had, but we were overloaded because we use our buffles more to carry food supplies and ammunition. I know I sat in the back of this time. I, I used to love sitting on the tire, the spare wheel, uh, where Nella nearly lost his foot or so later after my time. But I sat on the bin in the back holding the, um, the roll bar, the arm on this massive block that's also for, for spares. And we moved at night without lights. Every now and then you put a light on just to make sure and we had to get away, but they were mortaring the area, trying to get fire back from us by, by sporadically throwing mortar, mortar shells around. And yeah, the next morning, we had most of the kit with us still. And like I said earlier, food. I found a ton of Scandinavian, hey, my family overseas was supplying swapper. <laughs> but in any case, I found a, a ton of, uh, um, I think it was Swedish uh, bully beef and or, uh, more or a sort of a poloni type, um, a meatloaf type thing. While eating this, we basically found a piece of a guy's head and that put me off the food in any case but this is what the kit was this is what you were doing when you basically scavenged the things these are the things that come to mind uh, not important but my my experience there all right that we moved out and uh, lens um uh, the zulu battalion uh two one lens had been sent in to reinforce us because the area seemed to be quite uh, active. We did a few patrols. I'll come to the seventh final uh, contact in this whole situation. If I've skipped the contact, I can always, no, I think it's all there. But the seventh one, we were with Lens. And quite a big force now, it's two companies. Um, formed a, a temporary base with the vehicles and stuff. And then we were sent out in smaller groups to, to do area patrols. On one of these area patrols, we saw a bunch of people at the edge of one of the bush lines and started getting ready to attack these guys. But I don't know who was with me as, as a lieutenant. If I was alone as a corporal, I don't remember 100%, but I know um, I had the radio again. We carried mags, heavy weight and radios because the push room was too small, but we corporals had to do this and the lieutenants obviously always had a radio, but something didn't sound right with the, with the, with the communications going on. And I said to the guys with me, I said, uh, we better make sure. So we asked the, all units, all in the area, just to raise, to stand up and raise their hands before we launched this attack. And lo and behold, it was one of our own forces. And the distance was not, we couldn't identify. But by them getting up and identified, that was a close call of, 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 own, of own forces. But we all moved back to the base and it, we got the, the, the command that they were going to withdraw lens with the choppers. So water being an important commodity, um, the troops were sitting in a rondom for the uh, surround the TV, and we, white leader group and the Zulus, basically, let me just kill this phone. Boom. Um, uh, were taking their water and pouring it into the Biffle's hold, holding tank. The, for those who know a buffle, the bottom part is water, which helps also stabilize the, the blast if you get a blast. Um, and then you've got water for, for the bush too. So we were pouring this water over into, into the buffles when all of a sudden it looked like something out of a World War II movie, the sky burst. These things are sort of popping in the air, boom, boom. They were firing their RPGs high. They opened fire on us. That is now swap. They had uh, crept up in our sort of leisure moment, laughing, talking, bull, and filling these, these things. And looking up, you just saw these little puffs going in the air, and you realized, hey, it's contact. Now your weapon and kit is not, you don't, you don't 
your weapon is nearby. I know I grabbed my weapon was gone. I used to have a wooden a wooden butt F in um, R1. Mine was gone. But I grabbed someone's weapon and obviously did what you were trained, go to your platoon on the outsides and take control. And in this process, one of the campers, we had campers with us, um, usually the mortar guys, to, to, to carry the bigger mortars because the bush one, like I said, too small. Always good to be small in life sometimes. But in any case, um, one of these campers had grabbed uh, um, a rifle with a 103 on it. Now, anyone training on a 103, Rifle grenade was lint to shoot it with the gas totally closed, which you can't shoot out of the shoulder. We added on normal and it didn't have the trajectory that it basically required, but no, no contact was far, it was always close. But this guy had grabbed up and never done it in his life, had seen the Bushman, picked up the rifle and fired the 103, but he had left quite a bit of a space. And this guy went down. Oh. And I thought, oh, you've been hit. And as I got to him, he was holding his shoulder and probably said, no, Coco, this is okay. Um, it's the recoil of the watch. And I went on. We moved in a, a straight out line when the fires, the, the firefight subsided. We moved in a, in a straight out line. And I can remember George Tawil. Um, he always wore a t shirt under his brows, under his uniform. And he loved this red Adidas T-shirt. And that day, I can remember, and it still rings a bell to me. And, uh, you know, George, you you stand out like something terrible because I could see George in the distance walking with his red T-shirt. And I mean, any enemy that was wake up could have taken George out. George, if you watch this, um, <laughs> have fun at the jest that a person has in a contact. But all of a sudden, uh, one of the lens lance corporals opened a, opened a shot, fired a shot. By that time, some of the officers had moved forward, you know, looking for bodies and stuff, and which I shouldn't have done. But in any case, uh, we, we were untouchable. Uh, you, you were young and we don't get shot <laughs> until you get shot. But in any case, um, he opened, he fired a shot and the whole line it's, it's just automatically it happens. One shot fires and the, it has a ripple effect. Everyone starts firing. And the first thing that you've got to do as a corporal is control this fire. So in the foreign languages that you learn to speak as a, as a NCO, you subsiding this fire and it dies down. And But we that day we got another two and they were loaded in the back of the buffles. And... Only the next morning were, were they, uh, well, not a Kazavak casualties, uh, um, but they, only the next day with bodies were, were flown out. But I can tell you one thing, overnight, even though it gets cold in the bush, it, what a stench. And then again, like I say, we corporals have to, to do the dirty work to get these guys off. I mean, Nella will, will actually confirm this situation too. But the, the bodies were flown out. Um, sorry, I wanted to read an excerpt from this book. Just a short little piece, which not the whole chapter. It says over here, nine, I take my lease, but I'll answer. That's all, not war, that's age. But it says, um, in 1979, the Battle of on, on Dombe, on Dombe, actually they mention Aron Shavim, Aron Machino, yeah, I actually met him a couple, he's now no longer with us, but he was actually, it's interesting, I must actually find a couple of people just now and tell them, because I just saw his name here just now, and I assume it was, it must have been him, uh, Dr. Niels, um, um, Niels uh, de Villiers, the guy with the grenade that removed the grenade, lives now in Swakopmund, actually removed Aaron's one leg later in the war, um, in the bush, and they became quite big friends. I think it was Oren uh, with him, but I mean, this, this uh, I will see Niels in, I think, two weeks' time, we get together again, a little, a bunch of uh, old army guys, and like I say, he's retired now in all, well, he's still working in Swakopmund. But 
1979, we were the only guys in the area, according to Ben Wolf. I don't know. But you, you don't send in multiple uh, companies and platoons into the same area because they eventually wipe each other out. But it says the activities of the South African troops in the area at Ondombe between August and September 1979 were only too evident. Now, this was us. One day at 4 p.m., a group of scouts under Kandimbi were dispatched to re reconnoitre the area. Re this is a whole fancy word here. This is a, a recce, but just reconnoitre the, the area. The enemy had apparently already laid an ambush, fencing uh, fencing a semicircle in the water. Uh, when the reconnaissance group approached Ndombe, they first surveyed the area to see if uh, there were strange tracks. This is where we wore the North Star, so we, we, we fooled them. Um, but they did this only on one side, leaving the other side unchecked. They then deployed and took position before one went to draw water, two, sorry, not one, went to draw water. They say one. When they saw that it was safe, others oh, others followed. Okay, others followed suit, only to find themselves under a hail of bullets uh, from a, a semicircle ambush from the adversaries. One fight, one plane fighter died on the spot. Two, not one. Like I say, I have the photos. While two others, including the reconnaissance section commander Kambindi, uh, sustained injuries at the at that time, Detachment C was, was under command of Mashimba. There's this Arun Mashimba that I mentioned. Um, at around, two, around 7 p.m., Commander Mashimba led this entire detachment to the spot where the skirmish had taken place. This is after we left. The South African troops had already left the scene, but they were still around. As it was becoming darker and darker, the planned detachment settled for the night. On the next day, the reconnaissance section of Detachment C spotted fresh single file, I said we moved in single file, tracks of six columns and followed them. Uh, between 2 and 3 p.m., two things happened simultaneously. Detachment C clashed with the South African main body and the South African reconnaissance section attacked a temporary chief. I don't know this part of it, but um, I can speak to the other guys, the reconnaissance section at it, the uh, chief of staff's command post, uh, where several plan officers were operating from. One plan soldier was killed. I, like I say, we didn't, we didn't find any bodies in our area, so it seems there must have been another uh, detachment or another group of, of South Africans. Meanwhile, the battle between Detachment C and the main South African uh, SADF body had commenced with barrages of mortar and machine gun fire. The South African jet fighters roared in but did not release any bombs. Sorry, I do recall that they hit vehicles, but never mind. We're not going to argue about it. This is their point of view. Uh, possibly for fear of hitting their own troops. The battle raged on for nearly 20 minutes. No casualties were sustained on the plan side. That I can confirm. We didn't find bodies, although we saw vultures them, uh, you know, later the day. And it could not be established whether or not the SADF had suffered casualties. The South African helicopters arrived on the scene after the battle was already over, which is true. They came to collect our, our wounded. That is where we had 12 guys wounded. Um, hopefully, all this comes out in the book. All right. Um, that is the seven contacts I went through all in a nutshell. Uh, hopefully, in the book, we can get more detail, um, especially with um, with Donny getting the information. And I mean, there's guys in, in these contacts. It's uh, uh, Nella, it's Swazi, it's Horhor. Um, all these guys, Ackerman, Nikki, all these guys need to share their story to add on to mine. Otherwise, mine becomes the main situation. Sorry, I didn't fight this war on my own. I had you guys with me. So I, I call out to you guys now to basically give your stories, even if it's on black and white, or if you want uh, a call from myself or Dani on, on, on YouTube, uh, Zoom, we can record it. We've done it with Ben. 
um, or even reach out to Kwesa or, or Fossi and, and add on to my stories. I mean, it, it, I've got evidence in this book. I've got the photos, everything. So let three one start talking. There's books and books and books out, but there's books of 312, but by journalists. We don't need journalists to convey our, our stories. We can tell them ourselves. And it's actually down to the down to the nitty-gritty, the, 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 the actual feeling. And like I say, on that 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 ambush where they ambush us, I I prayed. At least calm on with the Sene. I prayed in that situation. And um I, I've, I've testified in church even. I was rebaptized. I was baptized as a Catholic, and I rebaptized as a, a Baptist. Uh, and in this whole process, you basically give your things and button. And that day, I can say I really needed the Lord, and I prayed. And yeah, I so said today too. I mean, a month and a half ago, I lay in hospital. Too. I'd give, given myself over, basically. Um, Swab didn't get me, maybe cancer would. But at the end of the day, here I'm still sitting. So it's scary. But if your life is right, don't you have to be in So I'm going to basically, this is quite a, a cop smuggling. I, 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 I did not, well, I cannot say that I suffered from post traumatic stress disorder, disorder, but maybe I did in a different way. I think we all handle these things differently. I came out of the army. Uh, I spoke to my friend uh, the day before yesterday, Falker uh, Schwong, Lang Data. He was in the commanders with me later on and also from his name, from school, also one of our karate guys. Um, so we're still big friends. Um, actually going out to Karin Zoy this evening, he's joining us, me and the wife and a couple of friends and I've invited Falker with. But Falker, Falker could confirm my aggression. The first New Year, we old school friends got together at Connie Contest outside Swakopmund, a little desert resort. There was nothing at that stage. There's a beautiful place now. I mean, anyone comes to this area, let me do some advertising. Go spend a day out there. There's animals, there's ponds. There's a, it's beautiful in the middle of the desert, the Moon Valley. But when we were there, it was just a dilapidated house and the guys would use the house to put the hi-fi in. You know, those days it was still LPs or cassettes. And we all, there was no invitations and nothing. Just a lot of, most of the guys had just left the army. And it was two years after matric. So we got together and yeah, about well, on midnight, the oh, the famous thing to do is to throw fireworks, and I still today, I I get aggressive. I I I don't like fireworks. I don't like going to shows. It it it, it my adrenaline starts rushing, and I I get I get edgy. I don't even like malls. I don't like crowded places. I uh, maybe my cop is not there, but one of the guys had thrown these little I don't know what. Thumb, thumb or whatever, they came in a little string with a little red thing and you light this thing and it blah, blah, blah. but it sounds just like machine fire, uh, machine gun fire. And I hit the deck. First reaction that you do, you hit the deck. And this, I may call him an arsehole, I hope he's watching. Um, I warned him, I said to him, don't do it again. And he took the challenge and he did it again. Well, he saw the other side of me. The guys had to keep me away. And I got very violent, dangerously violent. But I also found that art, any beer tent I went to, being karate black belt, the guys would challenge me. The cops would use me. They knew I was a loose cannon. I didn't like drugs like Daha and things like that too. And they would use me. I, I would go out at night not intending to, 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 to fight. And I didn't train karate to fight either. But if people pushed me, still today, don't push me. When I start crying, 
I, in, in that contact that I basically said, um, I actually ran with tears on my face. When I get very upset, when my adrenaline froze, f- flows, I start crying. And I know my son is exactly the same. If my son starts crying, get out of his way because he's at the point of, of, of destroying you. And <laughs> my son has a small heart, but don't push even him. And this is what I basically found in my life. I, I've got scars in my mouth and my body from these. Yet my mom would say, please, Ziggy, uh, Sigmund. My mom never could actually, if, if she calls me Ziggy, she calls me Siggy. And that sounds a lot for me. Ziggy sounds a bit more. But she usually calls me Sigmund. Please don't go and fight. I did not go to fight. But I never, I always tried to stop it and got involved. And my words, why I mention this, I think that that aggression that I came out of the war with stuck for me for, for the next two years. Because then I met Janita. And my burki froed for my gesee, my Afrikaans wife said to me, and I mentioned it here, my kids will know, she will probably see this too. She said to me, if you have one fight, I will leave you. I had two. <laughs> She's still with me. But at the end of the day, those twos were vouched were vouch for. I actually, if I get into a situation, I immediately pick up the phone and I let her know. That I don't come home and try and explain myself, let her chew on the on, on the situation. But um, I don't like fighting. But if I if I have to, I do. But that's my the, the town I grew up as an Englishman. Um, always being bullied, always in the minority, and the Afrikaans guys were still fighting the the Buru, the the concentration camps boys. I respect that, um, but really, this past, it's past. Start giving over to these things, it's past. You can't still hate someone whose great, great, great grandfather did a stupid thing, um, nor can I. I mean, I, I, I don't see the, the logic of even, even the, the Ukraine and, and Russian thing going on that we're sitting here picking sides. The war is sick. And my argument is I don't know enough. If I wanted to know, then I would get on the plane and go find out for myself. And that's what you guys should do because you're watching YouTube, listening to stories. Uh, start thinking for, for, for a minute. Start thinking. Don't get upset about things that you can do nothing about. So, yeah. Uh, Fossey, I think um, we can have one more if you want. That will be my commando, my PF, my art and then we call it quits because um, I don't know, maybe emotional. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I feel it's call it quits. I spent three months after the army, I just see the note here, uh, three months after the army doing nothing. Danger pay was good. Drinking every evening. My friends would say, Ziggy, we got to work the next day until I got a job and um, started realizing that you can't sit in a, in a, in a, in a, in a workplace with a, with a hangover. But I, you know, you come out of, of 14 months, not two years, 14 months in, in, in Thiel Battalion of intense drinking, intense fighting, intense whatever you want to, want to call it. And then you let loose into to, to, to Civvy Street with all these things still lingering in your head. And it's, it, it's dangerous, dangerous. I mean, how many guys didn't take their life? We, we talk about uh, Marco and Paul's situation. How many guys haven't taken? I've got photos of guys of, for in 1984 uh, that I met that are no longer with us. The guy took his life later on. Um, there's guys suffering. The guys who keep quiet are the guys who are a bigger danger to themselves. My own brother, I, in 2010, was the first reunion of Smoke Show. The beginning of that year, I said to him, Tara, we never spoke about it. 
But my family, uh, Taro is watching, will watch this too. And you'll probably get upset with me, but that's, that's fine. But I need to, 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 to say what I saw. I saw the pain. Yes, I pushed him. And he would get aggressive. And still does. I mean, what they went through, listening to their stories, reading their book, I've got two books at the back over here, um, reading what they went through, hearing the little bit that he has started telling me about from 2010. The next day, Tara needed the internet to do some baking. He came to my place and we sat down and he's doing his internet and he started talking. The first time, Smoke Show was 1980, 30 years later, for the first time, my brother opened up to me briefly. And then I started reading the book, which he bought me. He bought me both books, the um, mobility one, the thick I duck duck book is behind me. Um, and he bought me the condensed version. I think Marco also showed the book um, and on his interview, the green cover, a stem comp, uh, um, just the smoke shell situation, um, and reading it and then trying to relive it. I see it like sitting in a fish can being shot on because you, you feel safe in this massive vehicle, but when bullets start ripping through it, the uh, 14 millimeter and and the 2023 or whatever it was, I can't remember the, the I never had exposure. The anti-aircraft started going through this. And listening to my brother's story outside of the book, the fact that he had given someone else his place and sat on 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 on, on a box of claymores as, as a seat, only to have the guy that was selling his place taken out and killed in the rock. It 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 must mess with you. But Taro went to the reunion, and I think it helped. He he does. He wanted to do the trip to Angola, uh, then COVID came in, and they eventually went this year. But he's in Pakistan now, so he couldn't join. But he's still th he's still thinking of even going on his own eventually, just to go to go to that arc of of, of fire to 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 have that last bit of peace, you know, to to to, to make peace with it. And I think he should. I mean, I will join him if, if, if I can. Um, it'll be great. But at the end of the day, yeah, that was the... Uh, sidetracked with the, um, with the 6 one Mach situation. But I, I need to mention that, yes, uh, post-traumatic post -traumatic stress disorder well, uh, is a reality. Why of an ons? A lot of us basically say, ah, that was weak, you were weak, you were weak. And that's also what's stopping the guys from talking. We are forcing them to keep quiet. They need to let go. They need to talk about it. I'm not a, psycho a psychologist, but I know. I read a lot of psychology and stuff too. I, I, I don't feed aggression on my kids at Manpak Kareh. But my my apocryphal came out of a plucky. But um, I don't believe in hidings. I believe in explaining, talking. And even in my karate classes, the guys know I, I'm the talker. That's why I'm talking here today. And we need to give these guys space to to tell their stories. By us telling our stories, they will feel um, more at ease to tell their stories. So let us be the medicine for the guys who are suffering. Guys, there are guys. There are guys. I mean, one of the Kufud guys, one of the commander, not commander, Moth that was with me. Uh, Devet I used to talk to regularly. Devet said to me, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. And I always try to get him to talk and so and so. Um, I think it's now two years back. I got the message Devet took his life in, in Okania. You know, and it's sad. It's sad. Why? Because he was lonely. Lonely in his incident, not being able to talk to anyone. Family. Family don't understand. Why do we have reunions? To talk, to talk, to talk, to talk. And funny enough, it, 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 it's um, not all of them need it. That's why I, I, I always, 
I, I, I get upset with guys when they say, yeah, I'm here, they're going to drink so much of this and that, and how's your pop? Excuse me. I grew up a long time ago. Long time ago. I do take a doppie, but I don't pass out and whatever. I don't I don't deal with my, if I have personal research with, with alcohol, I'd rather talk. So yeah, let's get more reunions, more talking, more shows with Fossey and Chris. I'm, I'm starting to watch them all now. I'm, I'm sort of addicted now. I've always been addicted to YouTube and learning subjects, but I'm actually, I will watch uh, Marco's uh, video finish tonight. Um, well done, Marco, Paul also. Uh, I've always heard about you guys, never met you. Maybe one day, maybe you guys can join Toro and myself if we go to Angola. Um, that will be great. Uh, but at the end of the day, oh, even H, what's it, I think it's HP. Oh, amazing. I actually reached out to two doctors. I hope they watch this too, because I know, I know them personally, and they are both uh, plastic surgeons. And what a challenge to help HP. If you guys, if you guys, I'm not going to mention their name because that's that's no, uh, no names, no petrols, we would say. I wouldn't want to to expose them, but I reach out to a doctor in Cape Town and a doctor in Namibia that possibly could help him. And it, it, it would be a plea for my side because I can imagine 42 years of pain. I've got pain, but not from the war. I've got pain from misusing my body. Uh, with subs, I've never been on support, I can't lie. I used uh, Obex in my karate days. And the guys here now, whatever medal I might have, might have won a fighter when you can't cancel now. But I, <laughs> I used the diet drug to give me energy. Uh, and the pains that I now have is maybe from, from to do uh, uh, with that. I wasn't hooked on the stuff, luckily. I was warned by, uh, by a chemist one day. Uh, doctor prescribed it but the chemist warned me thinking you're playing with fire you don't need this shit so yeah um hp paul um oh france uh, france for i enjoyed i must watch his finish it's, it's a lot it's, it's two hours of, of of listening but i pick up little things out of each of these things which stimulate my mind too which which i don't Look at it as a critical situation. Uh, I, I, I accept the good, and I find a lot. I find a lot of belief, which we need in this uh, the side. But I also find so much positivity when I get up in the mornings after watching one of these things and my, and my knee pains. I think to myself, holy moly, HP has been walking around for forty two years. So I also reach out and ask anyone that can help uh, um, HP to, to, to please do so. All right, Fossi, I ekarakna yul van die punt af. We will have another one um, if you want. That will basically cover my life after the army and my PF and my art in a nutshell. I will make that one short um, because I think I've said enough. And to all the other soldiers out there, um, take Fossi and Kurs's challenge. Um, if you want their information, you can contact me even. Um, feel free to talk. And if you don't want to talk, please contact Dani or myself um, and give your stories. That's the three one, guys. Uh, give your stories for our book. We've, we've spent too much time, wasted too much time on stupidity. This book was discussed in 2009 under the boom there in Ramada with Les Rudman, with me chairing the meeting. Um, in the meantime, a lot of stupidity has, stupidity has flown. We've got the photos, we've got names, we've got everything, but we haven't got enough stories. We've got enough but it will be a watered down book. And I know what will happen afterwards. The guys who did not contribute will criticize whatever those who did contribute say, that's the normal thing. Um, or they will say the whole story is not a full story. Only you can make it complete. And sadly, enough, sadly that 
go on. Year by year, we are losing people that could have made the book a full situation. So, I think there's no flight, flight, my story is eight. Fossi, over to you. Ziggy, um, I've been sitting here nogging, nodding my head. Am I live? Yeah, I am. Um, many, many times. Ziggy has said it all. I have to say very, very little here. Apart from yes, please, Ziggy, you are going to come back uh, for number three. I would also like to say here, by the time this screens, I have spoken with Ben Wolf. Um, that will probably come out sometime after your first interview is placed which while we're speaking here is in a week's time your first one i don't want to call them interviews i hate that um our first chat um also i want to say that hp ferreira that video got a massive viewing and um i'm privy to say that so much so, so many doctors, so many specialists, so many right. ideas have been have been uh, rooted that, uh, yes, it's terrific, that um, Andrew Whitaker, 6-1 Mech, he's been channeled because uh, apparently HP just started getting calls from all over. Where people found his contact details, I mean, we didn't uh, let his number go. But uh, apparently they were flooded with offers and people that are, 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 are willing to even just show support and come up with an idea or two. So Andrew Whitaker is the man uh, sort of uh, tasked by the three one, uh, six one, sorry, the six one Mech Veterans Organization to uh, field all the calls. Now, I'm saying this uh, by now, uh, when this guy's live, we could potentially have had solutions. And uh, I, I just want to say, I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm sitting in the place where I know some of what's happening in the background, and it's massively positive, which supports Fossey, exactly what Zeke is. Fossey, I would like to add there that um, my brother, when he watches this thing, thanks for the challenge. I mean, a little WhatsApp um challenging me um <laughs> i won't say the words basically uh but i did reach out to the doctor that my brother suggested because they're friends of mine and um so Fossi, i'm glad to hear that things are happening i think um it would be great if you guys could um keep the broader uh, public aware once if Andrew can, um, Andrew was also one of the guys with, with Tara, but if Andrew could just basically, maybe if you guys, in, when something positive comes that we can just basically do a quick one, uh, even if it's 10 minutes, just to, to give a, a, um, a, a sort of a review on it. And also, yes, interview. When I said to people, my first one, I've got an interview. The family were all, because I, I'm sitting without work. I mean, I'm not begging for work. I've been without work long enough now. But um, from the age of 48, I've been fending for myself. But um, when the people heard, oh, you know, interview, interview, and said, no, I'm having an interview about myself, about for this uh, legacy uh, conversations. And slowly but surely, just with that even, um, making people aware that there is a channel like legacy. In the beginning, I really didn't... Uh, to talk about legacy quickly in the beginning i thought you know i think someone contacted me uh, one of my videos the bottom you got these things and i thought yeah what was i going to talk about myself and i started watching france and i started watching and i also thought you know who are these guys what are they doing and i tell you now i think your work your and and course's work is basically covering what books will never cover YouTube will be there forever. These are things, real legacies of the bourgeois. So thank you for the two of your work. Um, how are you finding it? I can't find you because I can't even find myself. My wife funds me. <laughs> but in any case, was it? Yeah. Thank you. Said that I will. Thank you, my lief. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so. Um... 
as I say, enough said. And I thank you for that idea. That's terrific. I will contact uh, Andrew offline. Um, and yes, thank you once again. And uh, this is so important. And of course, the, the Legacy Conversations email address will flash past here at some point. And Ziggy, uh, as we always say, uh, until we speak again, you and I, uh, and the rest of the internet and all the guys that are watching and girls, I thank you so, 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 so much. And you did mention quite a few things there, the food for thought, including maybe getting that doctor friend of yours that did that operation. I did see that um, the removing that uh, rifle grenade. Yeah, I saw that uh, piece not too long ago. Again, it came through uh, on the internet, that news item. So yes, I'm going to pipe up now and I'm going to say uh, internet, as per always, uh, thank you, Ziggy. Thank you all. And until we meet again, God bless.